there was two uh, six-year-old boys, they were twins, twins from Tasmania. And, uh, but both were completely different to each other. You know, one of the, one of the twins, the two boys, but one of them was just incredibly aggressive, incredibly negative and, and, uh, and depressed at six years of age. And, and, uh, and just, just everything was, the glass was half empty and brought up in exactly the same environment as the other twin. And the other twin, everything was up, everything was brilliant, everything was awesome. Lo- he loved the Lego movie, right? And, uh, and, you know, the, so the parents thought, I'm going to take them to a psychologist just to try and work it out, exactly the same environment. And so the psychologist built two rooms, and in the first room, he placed the first of the twins. And inside, it, inside that room, there's everything. There's hamsters. There's, there's goldfish. There was, there was every DVD the guy could ever wish for. There was a PlayStation. There was walkie-talkies, you know, just every, everything that he, he could ever want. And they, and they shoved him in there. And and left him for about five minutes. And then when they revisited the room, he was in the corner and he was, he was crying his eyes out. And they said, well, why are you crying? He said, because there's no telescope. And all I ever wanted was a telescope. But there was everything else was in the room. And, and uh, so, so they studied it and, just, and took some notes. But the other child, in the room, the other child, the positive child, they put him in a room full of manure. And they just left him there. And then when they came back, he disappeared. And there was bits of manure just being thrown everywhere. He was, he was in the middle of the pile, and now he was five foot under in the middle of the pile of manure. And, and they were shocked by it. The parents were shocked by it. And they said, well, what, 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 what's happening here? You know, what are you doing? He said, with all this manure, there's, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. This is what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. He says, there's only three things that will remain forever. Faith, that's a belief in things unseen. Love, that's a belief in things undeserved. And hope and expectation, something good's about to happen. Pony thinking is the thinking of heaven. And my role is to, is, is to bring out the pony in you. That the negative world that you come from is not God. God's an optimist. He's always thinking not what's the worst that could happen. You're thinking that. He's thinking what's the best that could happen. For, for Jesus Christ, the glass is always half full, never, ever half empty. In Hebrews 11, verse number one, it says, the faith, the foundation of things hoped for. If you cut faith with a knife, it always bleeds in anticipation something good's about to happen. Wherever there's faith, there's the blood of hope. If you put faith in a washing machine, then the dye of hope will stain every garment that you place in that washing machine. If you put faith in a jail, then you'll have the condensation of hope dripping down the algae windows every time faith visits a jail. Every time faith lands itself in a constricted environment, it bleeds, and it bleeds in expectation. Something good's about to happen. You put faith in a field, and at the darkest point just before the dawn, the dew of hope gathers around the seed of faith every time. It's just not natural for a Christian to be negative. It's just not natural. You know, the thing about faith is you can't tell uh, a man of God or a man or a woman of faith by what they've got uh, because faith's got nothing to do with today. So you can't, you can't, you can't say, he comes to a man of God because the house he owns or the car he drives or the marriage. It's because faith has nothing to do with today. Faith is lassoed to an unseen tomorrow. It's got nothing to do with today. Whether you're up, whether you're down, it's got nothing to do with today. There's no point having faith if you've already received it today. And the moment you receive an answer to faith, then faith goes out the window because its only purpose was to attach itself to an unseen tomorrow and drag it into today. That's its only purpose. It had no other purpose. So stop rating yourself. Am I a woman of faith? Am I not a woman? Stop rating yourself according to what you see because faith's got nothing to do with what you see. You can't tell whether you came here on a bicycle or an Uber or a Rolls Royce. It's got nothing to do with faith. The only indication, 
that we've got as to whether you've got faith is if God cuts you. And if you bleed and anticipation, something good, pony thinking, something good is about to happen. That is the only verification that we can draw from faith. That's the only thing current. Everything else is futuristic. But the only thing current is your attitude. And it is the natural attitude of every born-again believer to be an optimist. It's the natural attitude for you to believe not what's the worst that can happen, but for you to believe what's the best that can happen. My, the first book I wrote, and my books are available afterwards, is called Think. And I just took the world's um, favorite expressions, and I just kind of turned each one on its head. And we did a whole chapter on that. Uh, they say you can't eat your cake and have it too. So the whole chapter is, well, why don't you bake a bigger cake? They say, don't count your chickens before they hatch, but surely faith is counting chickens. I mean, what's the world trying to do filled with doubt and misery and negativity? What's it trying to do, kill you? You know, if you don't count your chickens, they're going to run away. They're not even going to get hatched unless you count them. You know, they, they, they pull down people and they say, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. It, the problem's not with the eyes. The problem's with the stomach. Your stomach's too small for your eyes. That's the problem. Because your ability to see ought to be far bigger. Your ability to see in the Spirit ought to be far bigger than your ability to digest what God is about to do amongst us. Your eyes are meant to be bigger than your stomach. Vision's meant to be bigger than provision. Every time. Never build a life according to provision. You live the smallest of lives. And I live a life according to vision. Let provision catch up with vision. But the world says, no, no, your eyes are too big. No, no. God says, no, your stomach's too small. They reckon, you, you, they reckon the bird in the hand's worth two in the bush. It's just ridiculous. One mingy, poverty-stricken bird in the hand. At best, it's worth half as much as two in the bush. It's just the world wants you to hang on to your crumbs and the spirit of God says let go of your crumbs and go for the gold go for the gold go for the two go for the two double your life and go for the two that's the spirit of expectation and there's only three things that remain forever there's love there's faith and there's an expectation this is eternal thinking something good's about to happen Come on, CT San Diego. Something good. Something good. Something good. Something good. Something good's about to happen. Something good. My our wife came home from a trip to America a few years ago and she came home with a book called uh, ADHD in Adults. She said, Dave, <laughs> she said, you need to read this. And you know, I've never seen a psychologist. But I felt like I was lying back on the psychologist's couch, getting totally analyzed by every single page. I thought everything about it, you know, like I, I, I didn't learn anything at school. Like when I say nothing, I mean nothing. Just nothing. Nine o'clock, I'll be waiting for 3.30. Just, I didn't listen to anything. Nothing. The only way I got through was because I was good at cheating. You know, if you it just, I'll just say this candidly. If you tell me a joke, I'm gonna, f I'm gonna, I'm gonna fade out about halfway through the joke, and uh, but I will give you a courtesy laugh at the end. But, but I have no clue at all, like no clue what you just told me. It's just I don't know, I don't know. Like, I just, if Jack Ryan has a shave, I don't recognize him. 
you know, I just, I can't see a movie without just losing the plot in the first. <laughs> the greatest agony was seeing Les Miserables. <laughs> I mean, after a minute, I'm thinking, oh my goodness me, shoot me, Lord, shoot me now. Just, just the agony. And then the pony thinker got involved and said, everything's correct except for the title. He said, you don't have ADHD. You get ADHD. He said, you don't have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, Dave. You've got attention deficit hyperactivity asset. I mean, just remind me how many congregations, locations of Hope City Church that's now C2 San Diego. Do I oversee? Do I oversee? Twelve! Twelve! I just love spinning plates. Even plate wobbles. I get excited. I leave everything to the last minute. It's more exciting. It's a gift. I'm a magician spinner. Just spinning all the time. I read a book called The Extreme Male Mind by a guy called... Um, Simon Baron Cohen, he's Sasha Baron Cohen's uncle, who, who's a psychologist at, at Cambridge University. And uh, the extreme male mind, it, and the, the, the basis of it was every man has a touch of autism. That's the basis of it, because a man can't both watch sport and listen to the wife at the same time. And so, you know, yeah, so, so. So, monotasking. <laughs> She's monotasking. And women say, we, women can multitask. If my wife's looking at a phone and I'm talking, I, I say, could you put the phone down while I'm talking? She said, I can actually do two things at once, Dave. Not like you. And you know, at the back of the book, it's just a pop quiz, right? It's just an autism. See where, where you are on the scale. I came, I came one under Asperger syndrome. That's high. <laughs> you know what I thought? I thought, Lord, another gift. And God said, you know, if it wasn't for autism, there would be no Bill Gates. There would be no Steve Jobs. There'd be no Apple. We'd all be on Nokias. It'd be useless. Useless. There'd be no Einstein. There'd be no one working down your mobile phone store. <laughs> There'd be no Michelangelo. Because wrapped up in that disorder is the brilliance of Tesla, the brilliance of Edison, the brilliance of the brilliant is wrapped up in what the world calls a disorder. It's not a disorder. It's a gift in disguise. It's gold under topsoil. And it's pony thinking that says, there's gold under that topsoil. But it's the thinking of the world that says, let's throw the topsoil out with the gold. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't want to throw the pony out with the manure. What a psychologist, what, what, what kind of psychologist would throw the pony out with the manure? And yet something very twisted's come upon our world. They reckon I got OCD. 
back when I was in grade 10, 10th year in schooling in, in, in Australia, I used to go home and, and rewrite all my notes in, ten, in, in four different color pens. I, I failed that year, but my notes looked brilliant. I always wear a white T-shirt to bed. It can't, have, it can't have any red on it. Just a white T-shirt to bed. Well, I, I, and, and pants, you know. It's a bit, bit odd getting out just with a white T-shirt. Especially with these legs. Look like two pins. But as you know already, I don't actually have OCD. I've got OCA. I've got obsessive compulsive asset. How gifted am I? Because it depends what you're obsessed about. If you're obsessed about stupidity, then it's your fault. But if you change and reattach your obsession to an obsession with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we got ourselves the mightiest gift in the world. It's a gift. It just needs to be detached. Detached from evil. Detached from insignificance. Attached to righteousness. Why throw the gift out? Just because it's attached to destructive addictions. The problem's not the gift of OC. The problem's what it's attached to. Oh my God, is this preaching brilliant? I'm peaking, so you think it's going to get better? It's not. It's like. <laughs> but you know, put these three gifts together. I just work with the three gifts in tandem. The trilogy, I call them. I call them up, the trilogy, come on, let's get going. And Because I'm itchy scratchy wanting to do something new, ADHA kicks in because I love new things. I get sick of old things. And once I'm there, just autism kicks in and I'm like a Star Wars fighter plane in a canyon. <laughs> and then I got an obsession about finishing everything I start. Looking at a high achiever here, through the combination of three disorders that aren't disorders, you're looking at a high achiever. Because I got three gifts working in tandem for such a time as this. How amazing is Dave Gilpin? No, seriously, how amazing am I? No, it is incredible. I'm, I'm amazed. I wake up just amazed. You know. My first book, I just took a flight to Copenhagen, just shacked up in a hotel there for five days, came out with a book. So gifted. <laughs> you know, 50% of all of your weaknesses are mythical. They're in the realm of Harry Potter or... In the realm of elves and maybe not dwarfs, but it's in that realm. It's just made up. If you put all your weaknesses in a dump truck, half of them are mythical. They just don't exist. Because they're not weaknesses, they're just gifts in disguise. You just got to think, right, that, that when, when the world sees the night sky, faith sees the stars in the night sky. When the world sees mud, faith sees clay. Two men looked out from prison bars. One, one saw mud, the other saw stars. It's pony thinking. In amongst, in amongst other things we call weaknesses, aren't actually weaknesses, they're non strength. And it was Einstein that said, don't teach a, a fish to climb trees. 
because it'll just grow up thinking they're stupid. Welcome to our education system. Because we all think stupid. We just think we're stupid. But none of us are stupid. None of us are stupid. Well, my son, right? That, my son, when he, was, when he went to school in y, year one, right? So first grade. He used to, whenever it rained in England, he just looked out the window. Never, never constant. But it rains every day. And so, you know, he got his report card first year and it said he, he, he just can't concentrate. Just knows nothing, right? Second year, he's not good at English, not good at maths. And and, uh, and, and again, can't concentrate in third year, you know. Do you know he got saved? He got saved twice. He got saved by Jesus uh, when he was about four years of age. Then got saved by Michael Flatley. Riverdance. So when Riverdance came, came out, he used to hide behind the curtain in his leotard. <laughs> and he knew every single move, like every single Irish dance move. I've ever danced. I've been through all of his report cards. I've never seen one mention of the greatest gift that he had from four to eight years of age. It was the gift of river dancing. There's not much pony thinking going on. Sometimes, sometimes you just you just you just need to to draw a circle around about you, put on some dish on music. You know, bake yourself a cake and have a, have a party. Celebrate the gifts that are within you. You know, um, let's just talk about the Olympics for a second. That, that uh, In the 100 meters at the Olympics, I've never seen a Hungarian win, have you? <laughs> I've never seen a Bulgarian win, have you? No. Oh, no, no. No, you, you're not listening. Sorry, I should have said, are there any, let's do it now. Gosh, are there any Bulgarians in the room? <laughs> Sorry about that, I missed it. And uh, I've never seen a Russian win. I've been alive a long time. I've never seen a white guy win. I've never actually seen a white guy in the final of any 100 meters championship in the world, ever. I suggest every white person gives up. But you know, when the camera swings around to the shot put, I mean, she might need a shave, but she can certainly throw that. Seriously, she, she, seriously. I mean, I, 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 how, how, I mean, you, you go into the weightlifting section, I mean, if you want to, if you want to find Russian interference, that's the place to find it. And maybe, maybe, because the Bible says run the race that God set before you. Maybe you're in the wrong race. But let me just say this, right? That to, to develop character, for a while in your life, you've got to be a square peg in a round hole. Because that annoys you the most. Wherever you get annoyed, that's where God's at work. Right? So you, so you do need a stage in your life of being mightily annoyed by every boss that has bossed you around, right? So you do need a stage because God wants to develop character because He doesn't want to push you over with every wind of doctrine. You've got to be strong, have a strong foundation. And so God puts a square peg in a round hole for a certain season in life, but not for all your life. And there's coming a time where you'll be a square peg in a square hole, a round peg in a round hole, and you live life happily ever after. Non-strengths aren't weaknesses. They're just non-strengths. 
I'm, I'm not weak at cello playing. I just don't care. <laughs> no, see, I, see, I don't care. No desire. Never bought one. But how stupid it would be if I, if I went on thinking oh, I'm really weak at cello playing and had a conversation with you afterwards saying oh, I'm not good at the bassoon. Bassoon playing's just, I'm just really bad at it. No, I'd just be an idiot talking like that. Well, that's how you talk. I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> but now my concentration's been broken. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, etc. <laughs> so you're probably wondering, what about the other 50% of your weaknesses? Well, you might not have been, but if you were, I'm about to tell you. If 50% of all your weaknesses are fictitious, mythical, made up, the other 50% of all of your weaknesses are completely reversible. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 says that God's grace is sufficient for you and His strength is made perfect in your weakness. So wherever there's a fault line within your life, God wants to build a city on the fault line because He places His strength on your weaknesses. If you're a city... Uh, you wouldn't be Sydney. If you're a city, you wouldn't be London. If you're a city, you'd be LA. If you're a city, you'd be Tokyo. If you're a city, you'd be Wellington. Because God builds the greatest cities on the greatest fractures on the surface of the soul. And wherever you've been beaten up the most by Satan, that's where you'll be the strongest ever for the rest of your life. See, that's the way God works. That's the way God works that He wants you to be a skyscraper, scraping the skies, casting a shadow of influence upon the world around about you. But He won't do it on stuff you're good at. He'll do it on the brokenness of your teenage years. He'll do it on the brokenness of your childhood years. He'll do it on the brokenness of the, of the nine months in the womb. Because God wants to get all of the glory. And, you know, if you just look at where you're attacked as a teenager and where Satan tried to get you, if you allow the anointing of God to come on you, that'll be the exact opposite of what people think you are. At the moment, you think, well, I'm shy. No, that's part of your brokenness. You're going to be extrovert. And people are going to think, well, gosh, you, you, you're so extrovert. You must have been born that way. No, I wasn't born that way. I was born again that way through the Spirit of God, bringing His strength upon my weaknesses. And let me just say a couple of things about ministry, right? That I, I, don't, I, I don't go around doing a lot of healing ministry. And the reason is because I've never been sick. You know, the, the greatest healing evangelists in the world are those people who have had a sickness and they've overcome. They've overcome. I, I don't go around doing a lot of marriage ministry. And let me refine that because I, I shared on marriage just at Cherish. But because but, I've had a pretty good marriage. Usually the people who do best in marriage ministries just had a disastrous marriage. And God repaired it. They're the ones doing the marriage seminars. I ain't done a marriage seminar in my life. But when it comes to preaching on perfectionism, it has almost killed me. It has almost destroyed my life. So at Cherish Conference, I wasn't really preaching about marriage. I was casting down the sacred cow of perfectionism. I kind of love what God's doing in my life because I didn't have one conversation past three sentences with my mom and dad in the first 18 years on this planet. And yet somehow by the grace of God, I've become a Barnabas of the Spirit of God. Well, why would I be the Barnabas of this? Well, have a look at the past. Zero affirmation from neither parent for their entire lives. Who 
who cares where I'm weak? Ask where I'm strong. Uh huh. See, same for you. Same for you. That you're banging on about your weaknesses. 50% fake news. The other 50%, reversible. You know, the greatest long distance runners in the world are Kenyans, right? And if you ever you watch any kind of athletics, or you do, do you track and field, don't you? When you watch them, and, and uh, usually a Kenyan comes first. Usually a Kenyan comes second. Sometimes they lead in an Ethiopian just, to, just out of kindness to come third. And then the Kenyan comes fourth and fifth and sixth. USA 63. <laughs> and um, they did a survey of Kenya to find out where these stars are from, right? And in southern Kenya, there's no stars from southern Kenya. No one's ever won anything. On the east coast of Kenya, no one's ever won anything. In the middle, there's, there's a few winners in the middle of Kenya. But just about 90% of every, every victor and every champion comes and lives within 60 miles of a town called Eldoret in the Rift Valley. And I thought, what on earth is going on? So they did a study of it. And they realized that, that the schools were so far apart from each other that the school, like every child, had to, had to, had to go about 10 miles or something like that to get to school and, and so a five-year-old will put his satchel on. Be bare feet. And run to school. And they run back from school. They're running like an hour, hour and a half a day. Nine hours a week. 500 hours a year. 10,000 hours before his 16th birthday some kid in Texas on his PlayStation thinks, I'd like to be a long distance runner. Give up. <laughs> but you know, the reason why the schools are so far apart is because of poverty. So here's the deduction. What has created the world's greatest distance runners? Poverty. Oh my giddy aunt. Poverty has created greatness. Oh, if I could just, if I could just do an x-ray into every one of your hearts, whatever you lack shall be your greatest strength. Whatever you haven't had, God will double what you need to create everything that He's called you to be. This is... This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is what we're born for. This is the good news of the kingdom of God. This is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This is what we live for. This is who we know. Our Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit supplementing. Supplement. I'll just finish just with one more. Maybe the band could come, come up as well. Here's, let me just say this about the resources. If you get through, here's my book. Here's Jen's book, Prophesy. If you want to rejig your devotional life, this is filled with explosive capsules of power, and you ought to get that. I didn't have this at the conference, but it's here now. It's called the Mind Map. I've drawn your mind. It's an A1 map of the Christian's mind. On the left-hand side is the fallen mind. On the right-hand side is the new mind. Down below is the natural mind. And the Holy Spirit's job is to detach the natural mind from the old mind and attach it to the new mind. And there are trains of thought and every train takes supplies to habits which are cities within your mind. And the more it supplies, the, the bigger the city gets. The skyline of your mind will determine the skyline of your future. Here's my book, The Hit Factory, that the next you is the next big thing. 
Here's our diary up the creek without a paddle. If you're a pioneer in this room and you want to really be a hit maker, this is our difficult times. It's 15 year diary called up the creek without a paddle. Here's where sacred cows make great barbecues because I'm a smiling assassin of sacred cows. Here's my book, Jesus Save Me From Your Followers. Here's Jen's book. She is. This is a coffee book that's available. And here's, here's one of my favorite books called Man Boobs and Other Human Rights. If you get four, you can have one for free. Okay, is the band up behind me? I can't look back. I'll lose concentration. Is Deshaun up here? Deshaun. Deshaun. So there's the farmer in Kenya, and he noticed I made that Kenya bit up just to follow, just to tie, tie the two stories together. But anyway, so I saw this dust cloud. He knew what it was coming to his farm, and it wasn't a dust cloud; it was a cloud of locusts. And it just hit his a large property. It hit his property, and when it came, it ate up just just about all of the grain, just just about all of the grain on his property, and. And he went out there and, and they thought their livelihood was, was totally ruined. And he saw the other guys that were taking their grain to, to, to market and selling it. And, and everyone else was prospering except for him. And, and he was a praying man and he, and he believed God. And, and, uh, and he thought, what am I going to do, you know? And the next year he thought, I'll, just, I'll, I'll keep some of the grain and I'll, and I'll sow some of the grain back in the soil. And, and, uh, and something miraculous happened and all of the other farmers looked on and thought, what's happening to his, you know, that, that our, our shoots are one foot, his shoots three foot, you know, out of every, every head, uh, the, you know, we're getting 25 grain, he's getting 75 grain, what's, what's happening in that? And, and so he gathered them around because he prayed. He said, God, you're going to have to turn this disaster into an absolute delight. And he realized that when the locusts came, every locust died at the place that it ate. And he just grabbed his spade and he just tossed the ground over. And he put what had died and what had ruined everything of his crop. And he just worked it back into the soil. And he planted the remainder of seed. And while everyone else has stopped going to market, his trucks continued to go to market. He became rich that year. It's because that which was meant to harm him, God had turned to bless him. And there are things where you've been on Satan's target hit list. But that's just a giveaway to know the exact place that God wants to bless you. Satan's targets, he gives away his secrets as to where he wants to bless you. There's a plague of locusts that have come and eaten up stuff in your paddock. Let me say, get the spade of faith. Put on some pony thinking and start to Dig that manure back. Create manure out of that which is destroyed. And if that hits the fan, scrape it off the fan. And work that into the soil as well. See through San Diego, your future, let me say, is enormous. It's enormous. And tonight, if you could just wipe the tears away, pick up a spade of faith. I think, I think we're winning. I think we're winning tonight. Thank you for tuning in, church. We hope this message reached your heart and was one in season for you. We're eager to hear how God is moving in your world. If you have a praise report or prayer request, send us an email at online at c3sandiego.com to share. Also, to partner with us financially so we can reach people all over the world, go to c3give.com. We know you'll be blessed by your giving. Thanks again, church, and until next time, we'll see you soon.